We are going to be taking a look at the Christmas message today. The choir just uh, sang this song where my line in the bass consisted of, consisted of rum pum. Every once in a while, I got a rum pum pum pum. That was the high point. Uh, I can remember growing up, and I, I liked all Christmas, everything to do with Christmas. I was trying to think, there's some Christmas song about flying a kite, right? Who flies a kite at Christmas time? But there's some Christmas song about flying a kite. And, and I can remember Dad saying, I think he even turned off the radio. We were driving to Chicago, turned off the radio and said, that song's saying nothing. And he was right. And I remember thinking, rum pum pum, that song's saying nothing. What does that even mean? And that song did not mean anything for me for years. Until I was serving as a missionary in Japan. Now, many of you know I was in Japan for eight and a half years of my life. For five and a half, I was married to Yumi. But the first time I was there, I was there for three years, and I was alone every Thanksgiving. I think I made steaks for Thanksgiving. Uh, I was alone for for Easter and for Christmas, and I remember it seemed like maybe two of the three Christmases, I was waiting for presents to come from America, and on Christmas Day, the box arrived from Mom, and that was, but I'd sit, I'd set up a little Christmas tree, about that big, and and I would sing Christmas carols all by myself in my apartment, and I would uh, pray and read my Bible, and I would get sermons from my church uh, where my Uncle Dan was preaching, Grace Evangelical Free Church, and I'd get sermons, and I would sing along with them and sing along with their choir. And, and I remember listening to a tape, and I think it was a rock and roll version of Little Drummer Boy, and uh, I was just sitting there minding my own business, having a Christmas meal, you know, and this guy said, I'm a poor boy, but everything I've got, I give to you. Boom, tears just, and I said, God, I'm miserable. You know me. I'm pretty worthless in your hands, but whatever I got, it's yours. And if all I got is a little drum to play, I want to play it for you. And that song does mean something. Brothers and sisters, whatever you have, give it to the Lord. Let's look at uh, Luke chapter 1. In... Uh, I want to encourage you, if you haven't made a plan yet for Christmas morning, 10 o'clock, to be here for our Christmas morning, uh, Christmas celebration. Okay, Luke chapter 1, 26 through 38. We're going to be looking at Luke and Matthew today. So remember, Elizabeth is the, is the woman who has the son, John the Baptist. And John the Baptist goes in, in front of Christ to prepare the way. So in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And she could have been as young as 14, no older than 20, probably somewhere around Megumir Chie's age, 16, 17 years old. The angel said to her, the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. That's where we get Ave Maria from. The Lord is with you. Imagine to be a teenage gal, and suddenly, in the middle of the night, an angel appears before you and says, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Verse 29, I'm guessing, is a bit of an understatement. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. If Mary was a modern teenager, she'd say, wait, what? Thank goodness the Bible was written 2,000 years ago. <laughs> but the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Can you imagine what it would be like? to have an angel 
from God himself. Give this affirmation on your life. You are highly favored. Don't be afraid. You found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Mary was a descendant of David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And I've mentioned this several times, but isn't it interesting how Jewish this scene is? This is not something written in the church age 200 years later or something. This is written about a little Jewish girl who this angel comes to and puts it in the context, this is gonna, you are a descendant of David, this is going to be a king uh, in the line of David, and his reign, there's never going to be an end to it. How will this be, Mary asked, since I am a virgin? That's a good question. Did you know that this book is full of things that are impossible? Absolutely impossible. People say to me, yeah, but a virgin can't have a baby. I'd say, that's right. Unless there is a God and God chooses to do it. See, the whole book hinges on whether there's a God or not. If there's a God, then of course this can happen. What's impossible for human beings, not impossible for the creator of the universe. However, you're absolutely correct. This story is not true if there's no God and no God who loved us enough to come incarnate himself and give his life for our sins. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One, will, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And some translations say the Holy Baby. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age and she who said she would be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Then listen to this. I am the Lord's maidservant. Mary answered, May your word be fulfilled in me. Then the angel left her. When this happened, you know, the United States is kind of a young country. Rome was over 700 years old when this happened. And this is something very interesting happened on the very edge of the Roman Empire, on the far distant eastern border, out of an entire mighty Roman Empire. Or the, or the descendants of the Persians, or India, or, or, chi, or the Chinese out of the entire world. God sends an angel to this young girl in Nazareth. That's amazing. And think about the ways, think about the ways Hollywood does a movie. You're going to see power. Well, you're going to, I am the mighty Thor, and this is, my hammer, mirror, mirror, mirror. Or, or you have, or you have this big army coming, and there's this clash of weapons. In God, when He's invading Satan's darkened world, a world full of darkness, a world full of tears, a world full of death, full of hopelessness, God invades by going to the very edge of the Roman Empire and choosing a little teenage girl. Poor girl. And telling her, you're going to have a child, and he's going to change the world. Everything's going to change. There's an interesting parallel here if we go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. There was an angel there too, right? A fallen angel in the form of a serpent. And Satan, here we have Satan in the garden. Here we have Gabriel in the uh, in Nazareth, instead of our great grandma Eve, great 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 grandma Eve, we have Mary, or maybe Maria, or Miriam. We've got a couple of Miriams in our church. Miriam is is where we get our word Mary from. You know, Mary Miriam means exalted one. Didn't she have a nice name? God had a plan for her. We have Mary, the vessel chosen to carry the incarnation of God and give birth to a Savior. So 
At the fall, because of Eve's choice, we have this situation where uh, the entire world is filled with sin, the curse it's called. And now, because of Mary's church choice to be obedient to God, we have the incarnation of our Savior, the birth of our Savior, and He's going to bring salvation to everyone on earth. Isn't it interesting that during these two key pivotal points in history, I don't even know why this is, but it's counterintuitive in a Middle Eastern male-dominated mindset, right there at the beginning, at this pivotal moment, where's Adam? He's off to the side. And right here, we have Mary, and again, the men are off to the side. In this case, in the first case, Eve gets tricked. Eve buys into a lie, and here we see Eve's great-granddaughter, Mary, and she's selected by God because she found favor, favor with God. I kind of wonder if this wasn't kind of a gift to womankind, that if, if God wasn't giving this opportunity, Eve failed. In, 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 in a, it's not right or not fair, but in a fallen mindset, we can put all the blame on Eve. Look at, look at what women did. Women were tricked. Women were wrong. Of course, Adam's uh, even more guilty in that situation, but because he didn't play his role that God gave him. So Eve failed and she doomed humanity, but here another girl gets a choice and she says, let everything you've said be fulfilled in me. And now this is the model we have for womanhood. This is the greater victory. And I think that's just, a, it didn't have to be that way. It didn't have to have that parallel, but I think it's God in his graciousness gave Mary this exalted position. In verse 38, this is among the greatest words ever spoken. I want you to think about this. Mary says, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Look, here I am. May it be done unto me as you have said. Humbly to accept difficulty from the hand of God. These words meant her life was going to change. This life she was planning with her fiancé, Joseph, it wasn't going to be like she planned. It was going to become difficult. She was going to have trouble. How does she accept this message from God? With humility, she says, I'm the Lord's servant. Let it be done unto me if you have said. How do we respond when our path in life is difficult? How do we respond when things don't go as we had planned? And now my plans have blown up, and I had all these hopes, I had all these dreams. What were people going to think about her? And she chooses to say, I belong to God, I'll do what he says. I belong to God. I'll obey. I belong to God. I'll do what he says. God, if this is what you have for me, I want to honor you in it. Did you know what? When she says, I'm the Lord's maidservant, let it be done unto me as you have said, that's the beginning of the end for Satan. This, this cosmic foe of God, this great beast that we cannot fight on our own, When she humbles herself and says yes to God, that's the beginning of the end for Satan. He rages, and God alters the course of history through the courage and obedience of a young girl. God is cool. Satan rages, furious, despicable, full of greed, full of lust, full of bitterness and envy, full of everything rotten. And this girl says, it's going to be a difficult row, but I accept what the Lord has for me. And you hear a bell ringing because that's the beginning of the end of his reign. The church father, Irenaeus, he was born about 100 years after the resurrection of Christ, remarks how elegantly Satan is overthrown. He wrote, the wisdom of the serpent is conquered by the simplicity of the dove, and the chains were broken in which we were in bondage to death. 
Brothers and sisters, this hopeless dark world I was talking about, sickness and death and poverty and fear and anger and, and, and one group against another group, and, and you don't see where it's going to end and where is the cycle going to be broken, the darkness is pushed back when we say no to ourselves and yes to God. This is how it works when we say, I'm the Lord's servant. Let it be done unto me as, as you have said. Lord, if you want me to, to serve you in this situation, if you want me to make the difference, Lord, I say yes. And when you get more and more people on their knees saying yes, do you know that, that school that you think is just a mess and everybody's gossiping and everybody's backbiting and it's all, you know what? People get on their knees before God. That school becomes a Bible study. Kids start grabbing their Bibles. That workplace that you call God forsaken, you start shining a light, and another person shines their light, and another person shines their light, and pretty soon you've got prayer meeting going on at work. Amen? This is how the darkness gets pushed back. This is how the darkness gets pushed back. When we say yes to God and no to ourselves. I want to be bitter. No, God, I'm going to do things your way and I'm going to forgive. I'm going to let go of it. I want to think just about myself, but no, God, that's not the way we do it. I'm going to say yes to you and no to myself. I want to carry this grudge because of the way this person treated me. I want to vent my anger, but I say no to myself and I say yes to the Lord. God, I'm yours. By the way, if you're a Christian, you've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. He paid for you with his own blood, you do not belong to yourself. You belong to him. And he gives the orders, and we no longer say, I have a right to be angry. No, you don't. You gave up that right when you humbled yourself at the foot of the cross. Everybody understand? We push back the darkness in this world when we say yes to Jesus. And we also see this the night before the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, when the author of life, on bended knee, falling down before his father, says, if it is possible, take this cup from me. But then he concludes, but not my will, but your will be done. Giving us this beautiful example of how we deal with hardship. I'll tell you what, human beings, we have a hard time dealing with success. We have a hard time dealing with wealth. We have a hard time dealing with health. We have a hard time because we get these things and then we use them for ourselves. But how do we respond when life doesn't go our way, when everything starts to fall apart, when your plans are not going to happen? Can you say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done? Can you say, God, how can I serve you in this darkness, in this situation? Let's turn over to Matthew now, chapter 1. Christmas lights everywhere tell us about the light of the world, Jesus Christ. And when we, we can be reminded when we look at Christmas trees and we've got this star over Bethlehem, I'm guessing, right there, we can be reminded of this in the candles. Uh, at Christmas time, that the light of the world will shine through us, his children, and this is how we make a dark place. See the light and truth of Jesus Christ. See the light and truth of our Lord. All right, we're in Matthew chapter 1. I'm going to go from verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother, Maria, Miriam, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. I wonder how Joseph felt about that. Can you imagine that conversation? I mean, we can maybe smile or laugh about it now, but I don't think Joseph was smiling or laughing. This, he knew Mary to be an outstanding woman of God, 
She had character. God chose her because she had found favor with the Lord. And he was a godly man. And here she says, Joseph, please listen to me. I'm pregnant. But we've been saving ourselves. I did not do anything with you. We're not married yet. How can this be? Joseph, an angel came to me and God gave me a baby. Not only do you cheat on me, you're going to lie to me. Do you want me to believe this? And yet, because he loves her and because he knows her and because of her earnestness, what is he, what is he supposed to do with this? <coughs> Verse 19 says, because Joseph, her husband, her fiancé, we would say, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. He was faithful to the law. He wanted to obey the law of God, which in that culture, she could have been stoned to death. So here he is. He's torn. I want to obey the law, but I love her, and I, want, I don't want to embarrass her. I don't want to shame her. I certainly don't want her to be hurt. And so he thought, maybe I can put her off to the side quietly and avoid as much pain for her as possible. But he's a godly man. And he's torn. But after he had considered this, and we're reading this so quickly, I'm sure his stomach was in knots. He felt like puking. He had a pounding headache. He probably cried his eyes out. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. So he's exhausted, he's weary, and he's asleep. And the angel says, Joseph, son of David, so he's also of the kingly line, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived of in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and then the angel, although Mary was already told his name will be Jesus, the angel, God, grants him this. He said, and you get the privilege of being the father. You get to name him, name him Jesus. And listen to this, because he will save his people from their sins. That's quite a big deal. If, <coughs> if you are living a, a wonderful, perfect life, and you know, every time you look at yourself in the mirror, you think, wow, what a wonderful person I am. And you always have a lot of trouble with everyone around you who's always screwing up. Too bad they're not like you then this verse probably doesn't mean much for, me, for you. But if you've seen your heart and you say, Oh, Lord, I've fallen. Lord, I treat people so badly sometimes. Lord, I'm so embarrassed at the thoughts in my mind. Oh, Lord, I can, I can be so busy with busyness in the world and forget about you. And there is darkness in my soul, Lord, to know that Jesus came to save people from their sins Maybe that means something to you. This is a God of grace. It doesn't matter what you've done. It does not matter what you've done, what you thought, what you've said, where you've been. God is sending somebody who can save us out of our condition. It's like drowning in the water. You're not going to save yourself, but somebody can reach down in and pull you out. Is being down in a pit and you're hopeless. When somebody reaches down, you can grab a hold of their arms and they can pull you out. Our situation is hopeless. We are hopeless. Don't kid yourself. We're wretched, miserable. That's why we need a Savior. If you don't understand your sin, you're never going to understand Christmas. You won't. Because you won't think it's that big a deal that God came down to die for your sins. What a horrible position that would be. All this took place, the angel says, to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. You know, uh, God with us, we've talked about this before. I don't. 
want to hear the phone call from any of you. There's been a terrible car crash. I mean, please call me. But I don't want to get that phone call. Dan, I was at the doctor last week, and it's bad. But I think it's important that God is with us when we get those phone calls in the middle of the night. That God is with us when we're in the hospital. And instead of getting a shoulder surgery and getting out quickly and know we'll be better for it, we know that the only way we're getting out of the hospital this time is on, a, on our backs, cold. How about when your friends don't understand you and you're hurting and you feel so alone? Nobody gets you. Does it matter that God is there? That Emmanuel is God with us? How about when your marriage is falling apart and you look back and say, boy, I wish I did this different or I wish I did that different. Does it matter that Emmanuel is God with us in the middle of the mess? How about if you've just blown it at church and you just said some stuff to some folks, oh, why did I do that? Does it matter that God is with us? Does it matter that this baby was born, Emmanuel, to be with us in the middle of our muck. Real God in the middle of real human mess really matters to me much more than reindeer and frosty and all the other stuff. Look at this. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate the marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus, which means Savior. Isn't that neat? God, of course, didn't have to tell Joseph anything. He told Mary he didn't have to tell Joseph. But he did, and I'm glad he did. Because God brought Joseph into this and gave him a role to play. You're going to name him, and you're going to be a father for this child, and you're going to protect Mary, and you guys are going to go on a journey, and then you're going to have to take him down to Egypt. And We have a family for Christ, and we have a husband for Mary. This revelation brings Joseph peace, and this blessing allows him to actually take part Joseph now not only grudgingly can be a part of this, he gets to share in the joy and the excitement and the bewilderment, the wonder of what God is doing. And imagine when those shepherds come, we said we heard the angels singing. And then later the magi come. And Joseph realizes, wow. I'm glad it wasn't just that sandwich I ate, and I thought I saw an angel. And it's kind of neat that Joseph and Mary are not unequally yoked. You know what I mean by unequally yoked? I mean like an old farmer, if he has a big, strong ox, and then he's got a little puny, scrawny donkey that's about dead, and he's trying to, you know, go down and make a furrow with these guys. The ox is going to be pulling the... It's, it's going to be difficult to do things the right way, to get a, to get a clean line. To be unequally yoked, the Bible talks about when, when uh, you're friends with a non-believer or you're in business with a, with a person who doesn't love Jesus, and it's hard to go the straight way because they're going a different direction. Or, or one uh, spouse is really into Jesus, and the other person really doesn't want to go to church and really doesn't care. They say they believe. That's unequally yoked. But we here we have Joseph and Mary and it's so beautiful. This is a godly couple. This is the way relationships should be. Let every single one of us honor the Lord, okay? And those of you who are not married, look for a young man, a young woman who honors the Lord as well. The Bible calls Joseph a righteous man, a just man. And so you have Mary who finds favor with God, and you have this righteous man. And look at verse 24. When Joseph wakes up, what does it say? Boom. 
He went and did what God told him to do. Mary hears from the angel. She says, I'm the Lord's servant. Let it be done unto me, as you have said. Joseph, wake up. Boom, he goes and does it. Isn't this a cool couple? They hear from God and they obey. They hear from God and they go do. And that's the answer for our lives too. Life can be scary. Life can be dark. Life can be confusing and hopeless. But in the middle of all that, when we don't understand, it's okay to say, I don't get it. I don't know why this is happening. I don't know all of how I can change the future. But right here, right now, I do know I'm going to say yes to God and no to myself. And that's how the darkness gets pushed back. That's how the darkness gets pushed back. When right in the middle of the mess, I say, okay, God, let me shine for you right here, right now. This is how we push back the darkness. This is how the light prevails and love wins. When you and I, we say yes to God. And I want you to look at Joseph and Mary, this young couple, this poor couple. This teenage girl, Mary, she didn't have a lot to offer, did she? Kind of like that drummer boy. She had her life. She had her choices. She was a, a girl, a woman, even at a young age, who was already known in heaven for being somebody who wanted to please God. And this is not, this is not politically correct. And I'm not talking about we want to shame people and make people feel miserable, but she had her virginity. And she said, God, this is mine, and I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give my life to you. I want to honor you with my virginity. And, and I know the worst thing you can do in our culture is to, to shame people. Well, because of that, we're losing out on the beauty of living a life of celibacy until you're married. There's a beauty there. There's a power there. There's a goodness there. And to be able to give this to the Lord and say, Lord, it's yours. Now, we've talked about this before, and I, and I, I want to make things real practical right now. What if you've been living your life and, and you're not a virgin right now? You're not married, you're not a virgin. What do you do? Well, God is a God of grace. God is a God of second and third and fourth and fifth chances. You know, God, how, how many times are we supposed to give? 70 times 7, an infinite number. And God gives us opportunity. And God just is waiting for us to turn to us so that His light can shine on our faces and we should be filled with joy. And what God wants to do is to let you know you are forgiven and He will take you as you are. And there's an interesting scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12. It said, If the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Boy, I wish I could give a million dollars to the church. You don't, you don't got a million dollars. I got 10 bucks. God says the gift of, is acceptable according to what you have, not according to what you don't have. Boy, I wish we had a big, huge ministry, a big, huge church building. If there's willingness in your heart, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Lord God, we're a little church, but we give it to you, and we want you to use our church to bring blessing to people's lives, to bring more people into the kingdom of heaven. Lord, I don't have a great singing voice, but during worship, I'm going to belt it out, and I'm going to sing all my praises for you. The gift is acceptable according to what you have, not according to what you don't have. I wish I was a great scholar. I wish I was more charismatic. I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. And the Bible says, if you have a willing heart, and you want to give from what you have, even if you're a little drummer boy. So if you've messed up and you don't, you're not a virgin anymore, I want you to say, this is what I do have. That first virginity, I was born with that. I didn't earn that. But right now, I want to commit myself to honor the Lord. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to give my body to Jesus. And until I'm married, I want to honor him with this. That's a term we call secondary virginity. And I know atheists and people in the world sneer at that, but I think it's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing. I can't give what I don't have, but what I've got, I want to give you, Jesus. 
And Jesus said, the gift is acceptable according to what you have. God says, that's acceptable. I'll take that. I can work with that. And it's a good thing, and it's a beautiful thing. So we've got Joseph. He's poor. But what he has, he gives to God. And we have Mary, and she's also poor. And I'll tell you what, you don't need a lot of money to have a godly and happy marriage. But what they do have, I'm the Lord's maidservant. Okay, God, you said it, I'll do it. That's the way they live. And you know what they do? They push back the darkness, and Satan hates that. Satan hates that. So this Christmas, let's make the Lord happy and Satan miserable. How about it? Amen. Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.